Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce, also known as SMEC. Today, I'm joined by Ralph Meyer, Director of Product Management here at SMEC, making his third appearance on the show. This time, we talk about artificial intelligence, starting from high concepts like philosophical zombies and the difference between appearing knowledgeable and being knowledgeable. Then we trickle on down to some of Ralph's own e-commerce interactions with classic search and conversational AI as a consumer himself. And lastly, we get into the intersection of AI and performance marketing. It's a great chat. I hope you'll enjoy it. And just before we start, I want to take a moment to teaser two upcoming episodes. First, I'll be speaking with head of performance marketing in the lighting space. They've got brands ranging from commodity to premium. And we'll discuss how the post-COVID boom-bust effect led the business to need more insights and better efficiency. This was a trigger for great projects like marketing mixed modeling and building a pipeline for profit data. And then I'm talking with the person responsible for leading the global ad tech and paid traffic efforts at one of the most iconic brands in the world. We'll discuss large-scale product feeds, the way marketing becomes a CTO topic more than a CMO topic, and how the cookie-less future is an impetus for horizontal initiatives. That gets us into what are some of the ways that we need to change how we think and work post-cookie. So I'm teasering this to you for a reason. I'd love for you to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't. Give a rating or review if you haven't. And the best thing you can do, recommend it to a friend or coworker if you haven't yet. Those actions support this podcast, and they mean very much to me and the team. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so Ralph, um, thanks for joining us back on the show. I think last time we had you, um, we were talking about like pricing and um, some macroeconomic factors that were going on. We had discussed like the war in Ukraine and some, some really weighty topics like that. Um, and you're one of my favorite lunch buddies. Uh, I always enjoy picking your brain on weighty topics. So thanks for coming back on. Um, for people who haven't met you before, why don't you get us started with a quick introduction? Um, what are your skills? What themes interest you? What are you up to? Yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, always a pleasure to to have uh, on the one side a lunch chat with you, but also to have something that's being actually recorded and then broadcast to people. <laughs> so let's see where this uh, will will take us today. Um, well, as you said last time I was on, we spoke about macroeconomic trends and um, how we we think those are going to affect um, consumer behavior, purchaser behavior, and how that might in turn affect um, advertisers. And that is also one of the big themes that's interesting me at the moment. Um, so in my current role, I'm the director of product management here at SMAC. Um, and that means um, I'm largely responsible for our product strategy, figuring out you know, what, what products people want to see in the future and how we're going to build those. And um, I know you, Mike, you always refer to product management as sort of um, a mixture between building the right product and building that product right. And I do see it um, very much the same way. So my, if I had to describe it really briefly, there's like three topics that I'm, I'm concerned uh, with. One is desirability. So what type of product do people actually need? Second one is feasibility in terms of can we actually build this, you know, given the resources that we have and the, the tech that's out there. And the third one is viability, which is um, can we actually turn this into something that's uh, commercially viable as, as a product? And um, those things map back very nicely to um, the discussion we had last time about the macroeconomic environment, because that obviously influences um, what types of products and solutions um, advertisers actually need and what we as Mac should therefore provide. Um, and on my personal background, um, I have actually a background in software engineering. So I come from a computer science degree, uh, bachelor's and master's. And coincidentally, one, one large aspect of my master's degree was artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think that's going to take us into um, another really interesting trend that has been affecting advertisers those last couple of months. Yeah, um, thanks for that introduction. And um, one other thing I'll mention about Ralph is that he's, he's written um, a, a book as well 
um, uh, a work of fiction and yeah, no affiliate link on that. I just want to shout out what a, what an amazingly versatile mind and hard worker Ralph is. Um, but you also, besides <clears throat> all that, um, you, you have a really great uh, blog, which is can be found at ralphmeyer.com. <clears throat> and you wrote an article lately about generative AI. So tell us a bit about what you're, what you're reading and thinking lately. Um, let's start at this kind of higher philosophical level before getting more down into the e-commerce weeds. <laughs> sure, happy to. Um, as you said, um, one of my, my hobby horses actually is, is blogging a little bit on the side. And I like to look at things from, from a variety of different angles and primarily from the, the philosophical angle at, at many of these new developments. And it's always interesting to look at, um, for example, the very recent development we've seen with ChatGPT, where um, on the surface level, it looks like, um, you know, computers suddenly have passed what's called the Turing test in computer science. Um, some context on that, maybe the Turing test is a very simple idea of how do we test if a computer is sort of intelligent on the human level? Well, the simplest idea you could have to test that is just have a, a human being have a conversation with that computer. And if the conversation goes on for really, really a long time and the human being can't distinguish if on the other side there's a computer or there's another human being, uh, then the computer has sort of passed that the Turing test. Now, um, if you, and I know you had the experience and many of our listeners probably as well, if you're going into a long conversation with uh, ChatGPT, for example, um, you might actually have that experience, right? You might feel like um, there is a, a uh, omniscient human being on the other side who can answer all of your questions and then help you with everything that, that might come to your mind. Um, and that's a very interesting philosophical point there, right? Like, when do we distinguish between something being um, artificial intelligence or just a computer on the other side, something that begins to feel very human. Yeah, definitely. I'm reminded too of, I mean, this comes from the realm of science fiction, but this like empathy test that exists um, in Blade Runner. And I think that there's a stunning degree to which um, this technology can also pass not just on, on intelligence, but in, in appearing to express um, emotions and stuff like that, which is totally fascinating. Although newer instances like BARD, for example, my understanding is that Google is putting a lot of um, safeguards into place to purposely constrain um, constrain it so that it shouldn't even really use first person. It should not emote. Um, they, they really actually want to, to constrain that and, and shut that down, at least within certain contexts. That's true. And we've seen that happening, actually. And we've seen it unfold, actually, in real time with uh, Microsoft's new Bing where the initial versions that they put out there for beta testing had no such safeguards in place. And there were kind of immediate attempts to, you know, make it talk nonsense and make it you know, look like a deranged human being. And it was quite easy to, to prompt the, the chatbot to give you very weird answers, like to make it seem like it's a, a, a human on the other side that has some mental problem or something, or, you know, have it appear to be sentient when it actually is not. And um, Microsoft has put some safeguards on that. So they, they published on, uh, you know, how they restricted um, certain certain uh, terms in the output, how they are uh, how they're instructing the AI not to respond to certain queries, um, and how they're just limiting the, uh, the level of, of emotional expression. And in the latest version, you can also, as a user, configure um, in the beginning, sort of how how emotional or how serious you want your conversational partner to be. Um, but that to me, and as you said, Google is, is definitely trying to do the same thing with BART um, because the, the last thing that they want to do is have a similar PR disaster as we've seen with with the new Bing after um, this, this first couple of um, very weird utterances by the AI have been uh, publicized. Um, but what I wanted to want to say on that is um, one thing that I, I wrote about very recently is to sort of an, an, an unassuming um, consumer on the other side, you're very quickly tricked into believing that you are having a conversation with a real human being, right? So it looks like, you know, this, this thing um, actually wields the, the tool of language very, very well. 
and it seems to be um, uh, it just seems to be uh, uh, someone you can trust on the other side, right? Mm. But if you look at the, the tech that's underneath all of that, um, the tech is mostly based on, on statistical interference and on predicting based on what the user said and based on, on uh, initial constraints and, and, and stuff like that. It's trying to predict what the next reasonable word in a certain conversation is likely to be. But that has very little to do with, for example, what is factually correct or what is helpful or what is useful. Um, and to give you one more example on that, that's um, a very early chat GPT example that has been um, uh, floated in the, in the media quite prominently was um, um, an author who uh, basically asked chat GPT a very simple question. He asked, um, what's the latest book by this and that author, right, by himself. And the answer that ChatGPT gave with full confidence was, you know, the last book that this author published was this and that title, and it was published in this and that year. And if you read that statement, um, you would say, yes, that sounds correct, right? The guy wrote this book in that year. Um, but actually, it was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, it was the wrong title, it was the wrong publishing year, and it was not the latest book, but a book that he wrote like five years ago or something. Um, but it's, it was presented to, to the person at the other side of the prompt with very high confidence. And if you're not fact-checking that, um, you would immediately be tricked into believing that that is, that is true, right? And that, to me, um, when I put on my, my skeptical hat about all the technology, um, that, I think, can send us into, into some very, very dark places. Like, if we, um, if we can't tell whether or not we can trust the output of these things, and these things seem to be very, very confident in what they're, what they're, they're presenting to us, um, we might run into into um, severe problems. Mm. Yeah, we already live in this world of like truthiness and post fact environment, and and all those kind of phrases that come up, um, and it and it does speak in this confident, matter of fact way. Um, maybe you could just. Un unpack before we move down into the sort of the e-commerce level, unpack one or two concepts. Like I'm interested in this idea of philosophical zombies that you wrote about. Like it's certainly a cool phrase. Um, maybe you could explain that idea to us and, and around this theme of, of appearing intelligent versus actually being intelligent. Cause that's sort of, yeah, we said that chat GPT, it's just trying to predict the, the next word in any given sequence. And this has turned into a sort of magical unlock for pretty um, cool capabilities. But why don't you unpack this for us? Definitely. So, I mean, this the term of the philosophical zombie was actually um, crafted, I think, back in the, in the 70s or 80s, when philosophers were really engaged with the question of consciousness. They were trying to figure out what it is that, that makes us human beings conscious and how to distinguish that from other things. Like the pen I'm holding in my hand is definitely not conscious. Um, my pet dog might be conscious to some degree. And you on the other side uh, have a very high assumption uh, that, that you are conscious, right? But how do we make these distinctions? And um, how do we actually decide whether or not something is conscious? And obviously that has a lot of um, implications, particularly on, on moral philosophy, right? I can, for example, do what I want with my pen because we decided it's not conscious, but there's, uh, there are um, rules and regulations about what we can, how we can treat other conscious beings. So it's important to make the distinction and to find out um, whether or not something um, possesses some level of consciousness. And the philosophical zombie is this idea of could there be, um, is it conceivable that there are entities that look and feel and behave and speak like human beings, but actually are not conscious? So there would be no, no inner experience, right? You would have somebody um, whom you can have a prolonged conversation with, um, but there's no, no internal representation of the world that's going on on their end. Um, and philosophers have been uh, arguing about that. So there, there's this um, conceivability argument to say, well, is it even possible to appear to be human without having consciousness? Or is consciousness just a necessary precondition to have an intelligent conversation, right? Like is consciousness sort of the, the stepping stone that you need to have in order to be as intelligent as a human being? Um, 
That's an interesting question. And then the second question is, if it's conceivable, um, then what would such a being need, need to look like? Right. For example, if we would replicate um, all the, the billions of neurons in the human brain, if we just replicate that in a computer, would that be a philosophical zombie? Right? Would there be sort of an inner state of, of, of in a stream of experience? Would there be conscious, consciousness? Would there be sentience? Um, or would this just be, uh, would it be morally okay, for example, just to turn off the computer? Or in that situation, would it not be morally okay to turn off the computer because you would actually kill something that's, that's conscious? And to bring this back to ChatGPT, um, what, what many people argue is that um, with sort of passing um, what, what we could call the Turing test, um, ChatGPT has achieved something like being a philosophical zombie, right? You could argue that um, this appearing to be as intelligent as a human being, but not having any conscious experience on the inside, um, that that actually makes ChatGPT this philosophical zombie. So if you would think of it in that terms, then this first question, like, is it conceivable that there is something like a philosophical zombie? Um, that box could actually be checked because, yes, we have ChatGPT now, and, and that is the philosophical zombie. <laughs> and the, the, the question, the, the larger question then is, um, what does this mean in, in terms of how we interact with it? Um, what does it mean in terms of mora uh, uh, morality? And, and what does it mean in terms of um, yeah, how, how do we train these things to interact with us as, as humans, right? If you remember um, a couple of years ago, um, Google actually unveiled um, their um, conversational um, uh, chatbots that would, for example, make a, a hairdressing appointment for you or that would uh, reserve a, a table for you at a restaurant. And the way they would do it is that thing would actually call the restaurant or would call your, your hairdresser and would say, hey, I'm Ralph Meyer's personal assistant and I would like to book a table for two people at 8 p.m. tonight. Um, and then there was this huge discussion whether this thing would have to announce to the other person that um, it is a robot. Because voice synthesis was so good at that point already that... Uh, if you listen to that, you couldn't distinguish whether or not that's a person or a robot. Um, and that's something that we're that the people are thinking about a lot these days from the regulatory standpoint. It's like, you know, does an AI have to um, announce itself that it is an AI if it could otherwise be confused with with a human being? But you know, I'm, I realize I'm, I'm rambling a little bit here. But um, you ask initially what what's on my mind these days, and that's a lot of of, of what's going on. Ask a question, get an answer. No, that's that's why I brought you on, Ralph. Um, you always have a lot of uh, information at your command and a lot of uh, deep thoughts around that, um, <clears throat> which, by the way, is another topic um, you mentioned. I'll refer people to that article. Go check it out because you mentioned this kind of threat to deep thinking and to attention that this kind of technology could pose, which <clears throat> I don't dis disagree with. I think there's already a lot of threats to deep thinking out there <clears throat> and um, I, I certainly, I feel like I face more challenges with that than I did as a younger man. And um, some of it's maybe me, but I like to think some of it is environmental, so I can, so I can be absolved of any guilt there. But um, let's let's bring this around then to toward e-commerce, towards digital advertising. Let's just <clears throat> um, apply some gravity here and make this, you know, br bring this down out of the philosophical clouds and into the dirt and grime of, of everyone doing business out here. So um, you recently broke a bike chain or no, I don't know. You have to tell me what this bike part is because I don't even know how to say it. It looks like a French word. Um, and you went to Google looking for answers. And yeah, you exactly. inter yeah, and you, you interacted with two different kinds of interacted with google sort of index of the world it's it's classic classical search engine and you interacted with some other tools as well so can you tell us about that yeah definitely so the thing is um i very recently um, picked up uh, cycling again and i got a, a nice uh, kind of vintage road bike that um i mean she is a beauty but um she also has her um her, her own personality and apparently you know from time to time things break and things need to be fixed um because it's uh uh yeah not a, a very new model 
And me being a novice in, in all of that, um, I recently turned to uh, Google to just figure out, you know, what's what's broken today and what, what needs to be repaired and, and how do I do that? And actually, that uh, I used that last instance of, of such a problem to compare a couple different search engines and try to get a realistic view of where we actually are when it comes to building um, intelligent machines. I know it's a big term, but ultimately that's uh, the goal of, of many of these things, right? And so what I tried to do, um, uh, I was Googling for sort of uh, the, the make and the manufacturer of the bike and the term chain derailer, because that's apparently the thing that um, I thought I had uh, broken. And if you uh, take a, a, a very sober look at the, the results that Google would spit out for that um, and I list them on, on my blog, obviously, um, you see that very few of those web pages that are listed on the on the first uh, uh, result page um, are actually re relevant to me as the consumer in, in, in that situation. Right? It's factual information that um, might to a large degree be, be accurate, but it's not helpful. Um, it's just, uh, yeah. It is nothing that I can actually work with. It doesn't teach me about what a chain derailer is. It doesn't tell me um, how I figure out how to repair it. It doesn't tell me where I can purchase a new one or which one I need for this particular bike. Um, it's just a very generic list of, of results. And that points actually to uh, uh, an underlying um, limitation that we still have with how we're representing information uh, and making it accessible via search which is this um, 1980s or at the latest 1990s concept of we're just indexing everything. So we're parsing all the text that's out there on all the web pages. And in recent times, we also started um, parsing all the videos, parsing all the transcripts, you know, trying to understand all the images that are out there. And then we're building a huge database where we have all those keywords in there. Um, and when a user searches for some, something like uh, chain derailer, then we just bring up um, exactly those pages that um, mention the term chain derailer most often. And that's pretty much like Google works and pretty much like, like all the other um, search engines work today. And that obviously is, is not necessarily that helpful. What would be a lot more helpful, um, in, in, in my view, would be a more semantic understanding of the world. And what I mean by that, and I know Google has been working in that direction with their um, knowledge graph and with their uh, shopping graph on the other side, is trying to build a semantic model that says, okay, we know that bicycle, so there are, for example, different categories of bicycle. There are road bikes and there are mountain bikes and there are e-bikes and there's, you know, and bicycles consist of parts, and one of those parts is a chain derailleur. The other one is uh, the chain itself, and the other one is a tire, you know. And, and then if a person um, searches for something like uh, Trek chain derailleur, you could say, well, I know Trek is a manufacturer of bikes, and um, Trek makes road bikes, and this particular road bike that he mentioned has this particular chain derailleur. Now you could make those semantic connections and could point to much more helpful search results. Mm -hmm. um, to some degree, Google is doing that. So, for example, if you're looking for um, the, the name of a famous person on Google, it will point you, it will bring up those, those info panels on the right side where you see the person's name and age and everything. Um, that is structured semantic information, right? It's parsing that also from, from the index that it's building, um, but it has some logical understanding about the thing that's going on there. It knows that's a person, it knows a person has an age, it knows a person has a website, it knows you know a person has a biography and stuff like that. Um, and that to me is one of the, the, the very the, the very much overlooked concepts in, in knowledge management, knowledge retrieval today, that we would need to put a lot more emphasis on if we want to make things like uh, ChatGPT and all those you know chat-based um, search models a lot better. Um, because ultimately, what happened with my with my my chain derailleur um, dilemma was I tried to do the same thing on uh, u.com which is you know, one of those new uh, chat-based search engines, very similar to the new Bing, which would have worked just as well, but just wanted to, to give you.com a chance. Um, and if you go to, to them and do the same thing again, so you search for, you know, what chain derailleur do I need for this and that bike? Um, you also get results that look reasonably accurate. Um, and you can ask it, you know, where can I buy one of those? And it will point you to a couple of websites that would sell that stuff. Um, so that's good, and that's a bit more helpful, actually, than the, the static um, search results from, from Google that we've seen. 
Um, however, and that's where 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 sort of the the problems begin to, to start. Or that's where um, where the the thing starts falling apart. Actually, is um, when you make a, a very tiny change to your initial prompt to the machine. Like instead of saying what chain derailleur do I need for do I need for a track alpha bike, when instead you add in one little typo in there, for example, or you just use a slightly different term because, um, like me, you have no idea how to spell derailleur, right? As you said, it's a, <laughs> uh, sounds a little bit French even uh, if you yeah, pronounce the way the way it's written at least is uh, if it, I, I'm not a biking enthusiast. If it's pronounced derailleur, I've got no problem. But the way it's spelled is. Uh, quite different <laughs> probably, probably both of us are butchering the terms if there's any bike enthusiast out there please uh, correct us yeah or any french speakers <laughs> any french speakers thanks <laughs> definitely so th the problem is um if i make a tiny mistake in the input um to to mix metaphors here a little bit <laughs> then immediately the the wheels start coming off you know the thing starts hallucinating it starts pointing to to inaccurate results it starts um uh, even producing results that are not, not not helpful and that are even wrong. And it's extremely hard for the user to say beforehand whether I made a mistake that would lead the machine to doing something weird, right? I can look at two results, two, two prompts and two results, and I can't distinguish whether one of those is prone to be um, factually incorrect, for example. There's no way for me to, to tell that other than going to uh, another search engine, another tool, and trying to cross-check and cross-validate um, these, these results. And, and that's a big problem, actually. And that's um, that brings us back to the semantic modeling that I mentioned before. Um, because those, um, those new search engines is, that are based on, on deep learning and, and large language models, they have very little modeling they don't have um what what google possesses with the knowledge graph um they don't have that underneath um and therefore they can even make even less semantic connections between the things you're looking for and and how they relate to the stuff that's out there on the web um and that to me is a, is a very big problem because we are putting a lot of trust into these machines right i said beforehand they appear to be human like if i'm, I'm chatting with that thing um, I might get the the impression that I'm actually talking to a bike specialist there, right? But the fact that I made a small typo and my my bike specialist, on the other hand, suddenly recommends something totally different and, and points to to nonsensical results, that actually is a problem. That's uh, because I, I can't distinguish that, and because I would put a lot of trust into the information that's presented to me. And to to close this off, so to close off the the more pessimistic take on this. Um, I think we need to be very careful about how much trust we put into these systems, um, particularly when we make when we use them to to make more consequential decisions, like how to repair our, our vintage bikes. Right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, to offer like um, some some counter perspective, I I think that these are these are growing pains, um, and we have to see how that's going to evolve. Um, but I don't know. I'm like. To your point about the way Google search is is functioning and behaving here, <clears throat> um, yeah, they've they've definitely they've been working on semantic knowledge, and uh, I think you know there are updates around like Google BERT and and all kinds of things here, and you know it's it's definitely more advanced than just keyword density or something of the past. But um, I mean, fact is, I, I see I'm looking at a screenshot. You would search 2010 Trek 2.3 Alpha front derailleur, and I don't know if they were if they were missing some another kind of intent word. Like that query is somehow quite specific, but also it, it doesn't necessarily say what you want to know or do with with that. But it's just pretty garbage what they brought to you. Like there's um, some. Uh, page from 2017 about a stolen bike is the second result, and uh, you know it, it's <laughs> it's 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 kind of inexplicable the way that this SERP looks. Um, so I, I am wondering about that, and and I as a user I, I feel like the search engine result page has somehow I don't know 
gotten a little bit worse or less usable over time. Um, I'm I'm less satisfied with Google as a product than I used to be. Um, so I'm I'm sort of glad that there are some new technology coming in to stir things up, and I hope that it will be a net positive. Um, but another thing here is like about the ads that you were served, because I feel like a tricky thing, Google has these knowledge graphs, as you've mentioned, and they even have a specialized knowledge graph, a, a product graph called the shopping graph. Um, and this is primarily used to power and serve ads, as far as I know. I, I'm not sure to what extent they they use it beyond that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you did have a very specific query and the 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 ads that you were served, though, it's very hard to know which of those ads um, is is correct. Can can actually you know deserves your click if it's really compatible, or if they just bid higher. Um, it, it, it's super opaque, and um, I, th I think there's a problem there where the organic results were totally weird. Um, the ads were almost more relevant, perhaps because of the shopping graph or the product graph, but. It, it's still a, a challenging thing to manage as an end consumer. Um, and then to your point with the, with the, with the conversational AI, um, that this isn't, isn't quite there either. It, it, it's just a, it's a kind of an awkward phase right now, I feel like, and, or maybe our expectations are just constantly raising and raising and raising. Um, but I, I am optimistic that, that there will be really good shopping experiences and browsing and consumption experiences possible in with conversational chat. And I don't know, some people would say that that's, um, you know, I, I think it's some, some people would say that's a very capitalistic use case or something like that. I don't care. This is an e-commerce podcast. It's a use case that I'm excited about that I'm optimistic about um, where I think that, Google as it is right now isn't really fulfilling that that experience. Um, if you go to Amazon, it's not going to be much better. Amazon's experience has degraded a lot lately too. Like something's got to give here, and I'm and I'm and I'm optimistic that conversational AI could be that something to help kind of improve the you know help help manage the the dilemma of choice or the paradox of choice and and manage some of these things that are going on. Wow, so that's that's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> let, me, let me just add a few remarks. Um, on, on your point about, um, you know, sounding capitalistic when we're talking about um, online advertising, um, there are some people out there who think that this uh, whole model of online advertising is just broken, you know, particularly in the, in the media world, people say, well, you know, the fact that everything is sponsored by by ads sort of it, it kills journalism and stuff like that and the problem is i don't on a, on a very high level i would somehow agree with it but on the other side this is the world we're living in right and we get we, we as the consumers we're getting an, an endless amount of free stuff out of that um, because we're living in this world that's fueled by by advertising um, the concern that i'm having is if you're giving me that free stuff uh, in exchange for presenting me ads, then um, I would appreciate if those ads were highly relevant to me. Like in that conversational exchange that I had with you.com um, about my chain derailer, I explicitly asked, where can I buy one of those? And if I'm doing that as the consumer, I have no problem at all with a sponsored result being thrown in there, right? If the, the chatbot then says, um, Look, you can buy one of those at these three bike shops. Um, that's the one I recommend, you know, and that's the one um, that's a sponsored result and stuff like that. If the thing that it's presenting to me is highly relevant, like if it's the right product, if it's the exact derailer that will fit onto that exact bike, which, you know, making that mapping can be quite confusing for an, an amateur like me because there's a thousand different variants of these things and all are man manufactured by, by one brand and... It's really hard to figure out which one you need. Um, if I get a recommendation for the right one, um, I'm definitely willing to click on an ad. And um, if you look at the shopping ads that um, Google brought up for that particular query we, we mentioned earlier, um, there you see the big problem. It's like I'm getting 10 to 15 different ads 
the SERP looks like a, a, a you know, like a, a classified page from 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 a newspaper. There's ten different ads. None of them are relevant, or some look on the surface level to be relevant because I'm getting ten different chain derailers. But um, none of those derailers actually would fit onto the bike that I mentioned in the query. Mm -hmm. So um, again, as a user, I feel like bombarded with with irrelevant advertising mm -hmm. because I'm not going to buy any of those unless I'm pretty sure that you know that's the derailer that will actually solve my problem, right? And I think if we're talking about advertising, you know, fueling a lot of what's going on in the world, um, I think one concern that that's often overlooked is how do we make those ads more relevant to people? When we're talking a lot about increasing efficiency, like, you know, what happens, uh, how do we bring the right ads to the right people and, and stuff like that. Um, but there's also a question of, of effectiveness. Like if you can be at the right point in the, the customer journey and if you're in the right context and stuff like that, um, your ad is just going to be a lot more relevant and that's going to ultimately boost your, your click-through rate, right? Um, and that's going to boost it a lot more than just throwing another 10 irrelevant ads at me at, at some other point in my customer journey. Yeah, um, the sort of points as to what a can of worms here. Um, I totally agree that that relevance is, is key here. And then, yeah, there's this, this whole question about how how regulators feel, which it can be quite different. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, because I guess we're probably headed into an area of more contextual advertising. And, and and I don't know, maybe the ask is too big. Like we're talking, are we talking about an edge case here with this derailer? Like, you know, in terms of the compatibility that's probably listed, you know, in a manual somewhere compatible with the following models or something like that. And, and I, you know, I don't think we can necessarily expect the Google's product graph to have that, that level of information, um, particularly on an older model and everything like that. Um, but AI, there is the there's kind of the the prospect that AI, if it's read every little piece of thing out there on the internet, that that it could have this kind of awareness. But um, yeah, yeah. Let let let's see where that's going to head. And to the point about ads in these experiences, I agree. I, I I'd like to see good relevant ads in there. I think there's I think there's a great opportunity. For Google to add a buy box um, or, or do different things here, you know, search and shopping campaigns are for sure going to be present in these in these kind of experiences, and maybe new native formats as well. To me, a buy box seems like an obvious win for Google or something they could try. Um, but it it is there's there's many factors at play here. Um, and another thing before I let you go, Ralph, I just want to quickly pick your brain about. I, on the last episode, I talked about updates from Google Marketing Live, like conversational campaign creation, um, which is basically sort of like using Microsoft Copilot or Google Duet. It, it, it's one of these, you know, the, this idea of using generative AI integrated into a productivity suite, in this case, integrated into ads to help you create your campaign. And then Product Studio, which is sort of like, you could almost think of it as like an AI-assisted Photoshop um, again, in the UI, um, which is going to help you enhance your product images. You can use like generative fill on the backgrounds or um, the AI can automatically fix resolution, upscale the resolution or stuff like that. Um, but what do, you, what do you think about these kind of technologies? Yeah, I think we've, we've seen at, at, at GML 2023, we've seen a couple of very interesting um, developments there that are ranging from, in, in, in my humble opinion, from, you know, being being toys for, for people that are sort of the icing on the cake to some things that will bring us closer to the fundamental changes in, in how the, the whole Google Ads universe is, is going to operate. Um, to start with, with the ones you mentioned before, like these um, chat-based, assistance when it comes to creating campaigns um i feel like that's more on the on the uh bells and whistles part than actually you know something that's going to change fundamentally how the world works um 
I don't doubt that that's going to be helpful for some people. It's going to probably make um, people's lives easier. It's going to you know speed up the workflow from um, zero to to having your first campaign running. But on on that topic, I'm a bit skeptical um, how big the impact of that is ultimately going to be. Um, the way I'm thinking about it is um, consider the, the the use cases you have on your iPhone with uh, Siri, for example. And yes, I can ask Siri to, you know, put in an appointment for tomorrow at 3 p.m. and it's going to do that, right? And I can do it in a conversational way. Um, but ultimately, as a user who has done this once or twice, um, I'm just faster in picking up my phone, clicking new appointment, clicking save, and that's that. So I think there's some use cases where people are going to make use of those chat-based um, interaction models. Um, but there are others where people are just going to be faster in the existing Google Ads UI or in the Google Ads editor or, or in stuff like that, you know? And then when it comes to doing these things at scale um, for catalogs of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of products, um, uh, I'm still a bit skeptical whether that's gonna, you know, help people who are managing those, those large types of accounts. Mm. Um, the second point you mentioned about um, uh, product studio and having um, AI help you ultimately improve the, the the quality of your ads. Like I said, this this Photoshop like tools, like you know, get rid of the background and stuff like that. Um, that's definitely interesting because it's um, I think it's biting into um, the the market that that some um, external companies, external to to Google, had in the past that are tried that have tried to. Um, provide these things on top. You know, there were um, things that integrate into your your workflow and would make sure that all your product images have, for example, the same white background. Mm. Um, and having these things um, being provided by the platform itself, that's that's certainly relevant and helpful. Um, I think it's going to put some pressure on the, the market of, you know, tools that are helping you uh, manage your, your Google Ads account a bit better. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, none of these capabilities are necessarily new per se or unique per se, but um, having them situated right there in the user interface is just a massive home field advantage sort of for Google, um, which will definitely put pressure on on these third parties. Um, yeah, about the conversational campaign creation, I don't know, I talked about this on the last episode, but um, I, I think the, the time savings are quite clear, um, but in the end, it just remains to be seen. Um, is it is using this kind of an approach actually does it perform well um, better than a human approach? Is where's the where's the kind of the trade off there? Um, is it the difference between like for some businesses it's like I couldn't have done this at all without this tool? Obviously, uh, massive for them. And then there's there's other um, larger companies where. They have to do kind of a more compu complicated calculus on that, of um, what is what is really the increment of this, um, what are what are the trade offs, how does it affect my performance, because um, if it's saving time but hurting performance, obviously th this could be a kind of a bad outcome. So this this kind of stuff needs to be because it's like great I can go faster toward destruction, awesome, but. <laughs> And I'm not saying that's going to be the case. I'm just saying that this is totally unproven and untested so far. So that's, I think that's our big job ahead of us is to test. Yeah, totally, totally agree with that. Um, and I think um, maybe I'm oversimplifying here, but but I do see this as a sort of a, a long tail problem. And one thing that Google definitely wants to, to, to tackle with this is how do we make the onboarding experience easier to get, you know, all of those merchants who are not Google Ads, if there's still some of them out there, how do we get those folks onto Google Ads really quickly? And how do we make sure that they're they're using it at at scale and spending as, as much as possible? Um, that's sort of the, the long tail of, of the market. Um, and then there's sort of the short head of the market of, you know, really big spenders, really big advertisers. And as you said, it remains to be seen how much value they can they can draw out of these, these tools. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something in there, but there's also, you know, revolves around, around all these discussions about what's the, the PPC manager's role going to be like in, in one year, five years, 10 years time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the role of the agency going to be like and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot going on in the ecosystem. And what, what Google unveiled um, at, at GML this year definitely adds to that. Mm -hmm. um, there's one final topic I want to touch on um, while being at this, this topic of GML. 
Um, I'm not sure how big of a bust it actually made in the in, in the news, you know, compared to the, the generative AI experiences and stuff like that, um, which is Merchant Center Next, mm -hmm. where I think um, this points a little bit more into a strategic, strategically more relevant direction. Um, there's a few of the things that they're, um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to read the tea leaves here, obviously, but um, a few of the things that they're trying to do with this is reducing the emphasis of structured product feeds in favor of um, Google themselves um, parsing your web shop, parsing your website, grabbing the data that they think is relevant, um, and then using generative AI to just create all the different ad formats out of you know whatever you they, they define on your web page, right? Um, and that's going to put us into a more interesting. Um, it's going to put an interesting pressure on the ecosystem. And there is an ecosystem of, of companies that help you with feed management, feed optimization, um, essentially getting data from your your core business systems into such a, a shape and form that the different ad platforms can can work with and transforming it and doing all these all these steps that are needed to create feed for Google Ads and for for Facebook and for Amazon and for for all these things. Um, it's going to be interesting how how that. Um, that's that segment of the market is going to be affected by what Google is trying to do with uh, Merchants in the Next. Um, and also it remains to be seen um, how much of those um, auto-generated assets that we also see with uh, Performance Max more and more, um, how, how that plays into the picture. And um, as you rightly alluded to before, how that impacts performance at the end of the day. So we have seen, I mean, we've been monitoring the market very closely and we've seen initially some very disappointing results particularly on, on auto-generated video ads um, but this can and this is something where i'm uh, uh, really a, a tech optimist um, i think that this can improve really quickly and we're going to see um, a lot more auto-generated assets that are of high quality and of high relevance and can be produced at scale and at a, at a scale that um, is, is hard to replicate if you're trying to do that um, manually or, or via an agency. And I think Merchant in the Next is going to play a bigger role there than, than we assume at the moment. And this question of trying to eliminate the feed or, or bypass the, the structured product feed, that's, that's going to be interesting there as well. And it sort of brings us back to the initial question or the initial discussion that we had about how much structured information or, or how much semantic modeling does um, a company like, like Google actually do? And, and, you know, how much does it understand how these things connect with each other? Um, it's going to be very interesting because on the one side, as with my, my bike troubles, um, we've seen that Google has, despite all these claims about the knowledge graph and the shopping graph and stuff like that, um, it's still relatively dumb when it comes to figuring out that a Trek 2.3 Alpha is a road bike, right? It doesn't know that despite um, all the efforts that have been going into the knowledge graph. And to, to bypass that, obviously, to introduce things like the shopping graph and introduce things like the shopping feed, where the burden is, is on you as the retailer to provide the structured information, right? You provide Google with, this is the manufacturer, this is the brand, um, this is the price, this is the retail price, this is the, the shipping costs, and all these things. Uh, you have to provide that in a structured way because Google just does not have any way to come up with that information if you don't provide it that way. Now, with um, putting less emphasis on the feed in the future um, and Google trying to retrieve that information on their own, basically grabbing it from your website, um, it's going to be very interesting to, to see how accurate it is and then how relevant the, the resulting ads are going to be. So that's my, my more strategic take on, on what we've seen at the GML. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points you raise. I think uh, with Merchant Center Next and the possibility to automatically populate um, the, this data, it does usher in, it brings us closer to an age of like total end-to-end -end automation where your feed, um, you, you don't need to supply a feed. You don't, you basically just need a URL and you could have your feed generated for you. You could have all of your um, campaign entities generated for you, your assets um by and large generated for you or enhanced for you and so on. Um, and I think that this is, to your point about late adopters versus like these, these high-end enterprise um, businesses, 
this definitely feels mid market. It, it it remains to be seen if the if the people who haven't adopted yet are going to magically adopt now. I'm not sure about that, but generally speaking, I do think it it speaks toward these under resourced small and medium businesses. More like I think an irony of performance max is that um, it felt like it should be. It, it felt like it should be best for SMBs, but it kind of wasn't. Um, and and Google's found has, has struggled to find a way to really, like they simplify their product um, more and more, seemingly in the hopes of bringing on these smaller businesses and these late adopters. Um, and yet, at the end of the day, it increasingly becomes a budget game because it's just like this. It just ushers in more and more of this age of average where it's harder to differentiate um, where you end up having a very average campaign average feed i would imagine if everything is automatically generated um, and then what is there to do more at that point but outspend um, in order to kind of call attention to that but i don't know we're getting into speculative territory here and also i think we're at the end of our time box so ralph i just want to um, thank you again for joining us on the show um, always great to have you back Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce, also known as MEC. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com.